Today's lecture is about the perlite transformation, uh, the last of the major phase transformations in steels. So perlite belongs to the reconstructive set of uh, reactions and therefore will tend to occur at uh, reasonable rates only at temperatures uh, above around 600 degrees centigrade. And uh, it is an interesting transformation because it's the only one uh, which leaves the composition of the austenite unchanged in an iron carbon alloy because it involves the cooperative growth of cementite and ferrite. Ferrite has a lower solubility for carbon when in contact with austenite than austenite itself. And cementite has a much higher solubility for carbon when in contact with austenite. So as they grow at a common front, the ferrite is partitioning carbon into the austenite and the cementite is taking back that excess carbon into its uh, uh, growth process. So it involves the cooperative growth of two phases. So in our time temperature transformation diagram, which consists of uh, two C curves, the upper one representing the perlite transformation and the lower one, the displacive transformations, uh, perlite is a reconstructive transformation where diffusion is necessary, but you also see that a certain amount of carbon is necessary inside your steel in order to obtain perlite. Now, we don't often discuss the properties of cementite and we assume that, that it has a chemical composition Fe3C, a stoichiometric chemical composition with three atoms of iron per atom of carbon. But in fact, uh, it, its composition actually varies as a function of temperature and the phase with which it is in equilibrium. So for example, if I take uh, a mixture of ferrite and cementite at this temperature and cool it rapidly to a lower temperature, then because the solubility of carbon in cementite increases, we would actually get some precipitation of ferrite inside the cementite, okay? Because it's the precipitation of ferrite that allows the cementite to increase its carbon concentration. So there are micrographs uh, published of the precipitation of ferrite inside cementite because of the change in the solubility of carbon in cementite. Cementite also has a, a large unit cell in its crystal structure. Um, much larger than that of ferrite and austenite. There are 12 iron atoms and four carbon atoms in the lattice. Uh, and the space group is PNMA, P standing for primitive, and for these N-glide planes whose normals lie along the x-axis, M for the mirror planes whose normals lie along the y-axis, and the A-glide is uh, uh, an operation parallel to the uh, z-axis. The translation is parallel to the z-axis. Now four of the iron atoms lie on mirror planes whereas the other eight are at general positions in the lattice. General position means that um, you know there's only a monad passing through the point where the atom is located and the carbon atoms are all on mirror planes. So there are two kinds of iron atoms and carbon atoms are all on mirror planes. Now, the importance of the fact that this is a primitive lattice is that the Burgers vector of a dislocation will be very large. You know, uh, if, if, uh, if the Burgers vector is parallel to C-axis, it will be 0.45 nanometers and so forth. And a large Burgers vector means that it's difficult to move dislocations and this is one of the reasons why cementite is much harder than some other structures in steel. Um, this orthorhombic lattice also means that there is a strong anisotropy in mechanical properties. So for example, if we look at a single crystal of cementite here, then 
you can see the modulus here is highly anisotropic, anisotropic and the C44, the shear constant, is close to zero, but it's not zero, otherwise the structure would be mechanically unstable. So it's a highly anisotropic structure. If you compare the corresponding plot for ferrite in steel, you can see that the variation in the, there is a variation in the modulus because it's a crystal, uh, but that variation as a function of orientation is, is much smaller than in the case of cementite with its autorhombic lattice. Now, with great difficulty, we can actually make a large lump of cementite, and that's illustrated over here, uh, courtesy of um, Professor Umimoto from Toyohashi University. Uh, this is made by mechanically milling together iron and carbon so that it forms the cementite. Uh, it's very difficult to make pure cementite, for example, by just making an alloy of that composition because you might end up with a mixture of ferrite and graphite. So this is made using uh, powder metallurgy. And what it does, it enables us to study the properties of cementite um, in isolation. So if we look at the hardness of cementite at ambient temperature, it's really quite high, of the order of a thousand rickers. But notice that uh, as the temperature increases, uh, the hardness tends to fall quite, quite a lot. And that means that, you know, supposing we form perlite and then we deform it at a temperature of 400 degrees centigrade or, or roughly around here in terms of Kelvin, then we are dealing with a much softer phase. And cementite can plastically deform given the right circumstances. So that's uh, our description of uh, cementite. And we are mostly interested now in cementite as a part of perlite. So perlite uh, grows uh, like, uh, sort of like spheroids, beginning at the austenite grain boundaries. And, you know, because it's a reconstructed transformation, it can grow across the austenite grain boundaries into different grains uh, with which that boundary is in contact. And on an optical microstructure scale, uh, if the interlamellar spacing is relatively fine, compared with the wavelength of light, then we see these iridescent colors. And that's why it is called perlite, because uh, some of the shells that we see on sea creatures have the same sort of iridescence. This is uh, one of the original micrographs uh, by Bain uh, in his book, uh, Alloying Elements in Steel, which you can in fact download from my website, which shows that the perlite apparently consists of alternating layers of ferrite and cementite. I've explained to you before that th that interpretation of this two-dimensional section uh, is not strictly correct because a colony of perlite is actually a bicrystal, an interpenetrating bicrystal of ferrite and cementite. And to illustrate that, I use this bucket and cabbage analogy, where we think of the cabbage as cementite with all its leaves interconnected uh, at the stem. So think of this as a single crystal of cementite. And then we put that into a bucket of water. Uh, the water is the single crystal of ferrite, which also interpenetrates and uh, fills any of the spaces. Uh, but it's only when we take a cross section that it appears that we have alternating layers of uh, leaf and water, leaf and water. But in three dimensions, a colony of perlite is actually a bicrystal. And I went to some trouble to explain to you why that matters. Uh, we can, of course, increase the strength by refining the interlamellar spacing because that reduces the mean free slip distance and therefore you get strengthening. Uh, but the toughness is determined by how far a cleavage crack can propagate without deflection. That's one of the factors that determines toughness. Now, if you think of cementite at room temperature as having a hardness of a thousand because it would be easy to crack it. So we can more or less ignore its presence. 
in which case a cleavage crack can go right across a colony of perlite without much crystallographic deflection. So the toughness, in order to improve toughness, you need to refine the size of the colony. In other words, you need to increase the nucleation rate at austenite grain boundaries. And how do you do that? Well, if you start with a smaller austenite grain size, you end up with a smaller uh, perlite colony size, simply because you boost the nucleation rate per unit volume. Now, in many structural steels, as I've already pointed out, you know, the beams that are used for buildings and bridges and so forth, you have a mixture of ferrite and perlite, okay? because the strength levels that you need uh, a part of the basket of properties that you need are of the order of three to 400 megapascals for reasons which I've already explained. But supposing we make a completely perlitic steel, okay, which uh, is 100% perlite, uh, so it might have a composition close to the eutectoid composition, then we can exploit its strength by drawing it into wires. So you introduce more deformation into the microstructure uh, by wire drawing. And you can, you can easily reach strengths of the order of two gigapascals in wire form. And steel ropes are made by winding together these wires uh, or in exceptional circumstances, you use straight strands. So in spite of the high strength, uh, the toughness as we think about it conventionally, doesn't matter too much because the failure of a rope consisting of many filaments depends really on a catastrophic failure of many filaments together, which is a rare occurrence. So almost all steel wires, which are used, for example, for heavy lifting or for suspension bridges, uh, and so on, they are made from perlite, which has been drawn down into filaments and then wound into ropes. Now, I mentioned that this is the Taipei 101 building, which has 101 stories. And back in 2010, it was the tallest building in the world. And one problem with tall buildings is they will oscillate uh, due to wind, for example. And of course, this is also in an earthquake zone. And to illustrate this to you, uh, I went to another building, uh, which is 60 stories tall in uh, Moscow. And generally speaking, that, uh, that um, sort of a building, which is only 60 stories high, um, doesn't need much of uh, specific engineering to cut down the elastic deformations, but they exist. So on, a, on the particular day that I was in the building, uh, there was um, very, uh, very high, uh, there were very high winds. And we were in a restaurant on the 60th floor with a chandelier above. And I could see the chandelier. <laughs> Yeah, the, these are the motions of the chandelier because of the wind action for the elastic deformation of the tower. And they are quite significant, as you can see, but not significant enough to put in specific structural engineering that dampens those vibrations. Now, in the Taipei 101 building, we have to have a system which damps the vibrations, otherwise the movement at the very top would be of the order of a meter. So these are steel ropes, which are hanging from something like the 96th floor down to something like the 80th floor and supporting a huge steel ball. This is assembled from steel plates and welded together. And it weighs, I think it's about 90 tons. And I was in the building when this was being constructed. So there's, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure here for the construction purpose. But I'll show you now the finished product, 
which has been painted gold because it's a tourist attraction. And these are the steel wires, uh, steel ropes made from perlite, which support this gigantic steel ball. Uh, and the steel ball is attached to these dampers. And therefore, you know, if, if there is uh, induced vibration, the ball and the dampers will move and reduce that dramatically. Okay, so these steel ropes have to support this huge weight uh, over, over the lifetime of the building, essentially. And they are made from perlite, drawn perlite. Similarly, this is the longer, uh, this is the bridge between Kobe a city and Awaji Island. And it has the largest uh, central span in the world, about two kilometers. And it is a suspension bridge where the ropes here and here are basically uh, politic ropes. Okay, um, so one of the major applications of uh, completely perlitic steel is in making these wire ropes. Now, perlite is a two-phase mixture. So when we think about its nucleation, uh, we need to think about what happens first. Is it the ferrite that nucleates first and therefore partitions carbon and therefore stimulates the precipitation of cementite and then they grow cooperative to, cooperatively together to form a colony? Well, uh, Honeycomb and Dipana solved this problem many years ago that if you are dealing with a high pore eutectoid steel, that means a carbon concentration less than uh, the eutectoid composition, then you should expect ferrite to nucleate first. And if you are dealing with a hyper eutectoid steel, then you should expect cementite to nucleate first. That makes a lot of sense. So the nucleation of perlite, uh, you should think about the nucleation of the two phases and then the establishment of cooperative growth at a common transformation front uh, like so. And we can imagine uh, the perlite uh, in, in a mathematical model, a much simplified mathematical model to consist of these alternating layers of cementite and ferrite. Uh, and the interlamella spacing is given by the distance s. And because the carbon that is partitioned by the ferrite into the austenite is absorbed by the cementite, uh, the diffusion is now parallel to the interface rather than normal to the interface. So it goes through the austenite and helps the cementite to grow. And therefore, there is no net change in the composition of the austenite away from the interface, at least as far as iron carbon alloys are concerned. So we can treat the growth rate of this uh, as follows. First of all, we need to know the composition uh, in the austenite in contact with the ferrite and the composition in the austenite in contact with the cementite because the diffusion is through the austenite roughly parallel to the interface. Well, uh, these are the phase boundaries which define the composition of the austenite. Uh, in equilibrium with cementite and austenite in equilibrium with ferrite. So these two boundaries give us the chemical compositions here and here, which create a gradient that drives the diffusion. So the composition uh, in the austenite in contact with cementite is smaller than the composition in contact with ferrite. And therefore you have a gradient of composition driving that diffusion or free energy gradient if you like. Now we normally say that you know if you cool a steel with a uh, eutectoid composition you will get 100% perlite but actually uh, even if you don't have a eutectoid composition but you super cool it into this region between these two phase boundaries extrapolated phase boundaries then both cementite and ferrite can precipitate from austenite. And that's the condition, necessary condition for perlite formation, that both phases must be able to precipitate. 
So if you supercool hypoeutectoid austenite into this region, you can still get 100% of perlite, but the layers of cementite will be thinner. Uh, well, the volume fraction of cementite will be smaller and therefore the layers of cementite will be thinner when you get 100% perlite in a hypoeutectoid steel. And similarly, if you take austenite, which is hyperutectoid, and supercool it into this region, then you will be able to form perlite with a larger volume fraction of cementite. Okay? So this region here is known as the Hultgren extrapolation, where you can actually get 100% perlite, even though uh, the average composition of the steel is not exactly given by the eutectoid composition. So we can treat this problem as we've done uh, other problems of diffusion control growth. We work out you know, the rate at which solute is partitioned and the rate at which is taken away from the interface in order to maintain local equilibrium. And since both phases are growing at the same rate, uh, we, we have to, uh, we can derive an equation which describes the growth rate of the ferrite and it should give us, uh, we should obtain an identical growth rate if we do the same derivation for the cementite. So here is our classic equation where this is the rate at which solute is absorbed by the cementite here. This is the velocity of the transformation front. And this is the gradient at the interface, which is uh, the composition of the cementite minus the composition of the austenite that is in contact with cementite and the composition here uh, in the austenite in contact with ferrite. So the rate at which solute is arriving here by diffusion must be equal to the rate at which it is being absorbed by the cementite. And the diffusion distance we take as related to the interlamellar spacing S. So there's this uh, number here, which is uh, a constant because you know, the diffusion distance may be smaller on average than the interlamellar spacing because carbon in this region has a smaller distance to travel. Okay? But let's not worry about this and we'll assume that uh, A is just one. So that is the fundamental equation describing the growth rate. And we have the same problem that we encountered, for example, with uh, Wiedemann-Sarton ferrite, uh, where, you know, if the plate tip radius gets very small and we ignore the effect of interfacial energy, then we expect the velocity to increase indefinitely as the plate tip radius is reduced. Similarly here, the velocity will increase indefinitely as the interlamellar spacing is reduced. And that doesn't make sense. And what we are missing here is that during this growth process, we are creating these interfaces. Okay, so there is a cost to that, um, to those interfaces. So, um, sorry, this is just to illustrate that that much carbon is absorbed by the cementite as the, as it grows per unit time. Okay, so let's consider how, how much uh, interface we have in our material. So let's uh, take this as our colony of perlite and we have one interface here, two interfaces here and one interface here because these are shared with the other side. And this is twice the interlamellar spacing. So The area of each interface is uh, 4s squared, 4s squared, and we have four such interfaces in this region. So we have to take 4 multiplied by 4s squared, and the volume of that region is 2s cubed, which is 8, uh, uh, is a uh, 2s in brackets cubed, which is 8s cubed. So 
the surface per unit volume, which we conventionally write like so, is simply given by two divided by S. Okay. So the surface per unit volume is given by two divided by the interlaminar spacing. Now it turns out that this equation is actually quite generic, even though I've used an oversimplified model for the colony, that if you replace S by the mean linear intercept, uh, say for example, you're looking at ferrite grain size, etc., then two divided by the mean linear intercept gives you the amount of surface per unit volume. Of course, uh, the reason why we are doing this is we want to work out the cost associated with the interfacial energy, the creation of interfacial energy between alpha and theta. And that cost is straightforward, that if we take the interfacial energy per unit area here, okay, and we multiply it by the amount of surface per unit volume, then that basically gives us the cost due to the creation of the ferrite cementite interfaces. Okay. So uh, imagine that delta G uh, here is our chemical driving force. Uh, then we have to allow for the cost of creating interfaces by removing two sigma over S. Okay, so that's the interf uh, interfacial energy per unit volume that we have to remove from the available free energy. So, oops, sorry. So the effective free energy is this minus this. Now, at some critical value of the interlaminar spacing, all of the free energy will be consumed in creating interfaces. So we can set this to zero, and therefore delta G at the critical spacing will equal two sigma over SC, the critical spacing. And we can now substitute for delta G into this equation. So we get delta G dashed is that minus that. Okay. So that's the chemical driving force minus the cost of creating interfaces. And if I rearrange that, that's two sigma into one over SC minus one over S, which is, uh, which is the same as this, okay? So, so remember this bit here. What we are going to do is scale the equation for the velocity by this bit because that removes the cost of creating interfacial energy. Okay, so here we are. This was our original equation here. And we modify this by adding that term, which is one minus, uh, by multiplying by the term one minus SCOS, and this is the SC, which was one upon SC. Uh, and this now gives us a velocity for the growth of the perlite that accounts for interfacial energy. So if I plot that velocity, as a function of the lamella spacing, then I now get a, a curve with a peak in it instead of one that goes off indefinitely to infinite velocity as the lamella spacing becomes finer and finer. So we are faced with the same problem as Wiedemann and Farad that we get the growth rate as a function of a length, right? In this case, lamella spacing. And you can make some assumption to pick the actual velocity and the usual assumption made is that the growth rate is given by the maximum value as the interlamella spacing is given by that spacing which gives you the maximum growth rate okay uh, so we've, we've got this equation here um, which gives us the velocity and we have an additional term there which takes account of um, um, interfacial energy, but I've, I've excluded that for the moment. So this is the rate at which solid is absorbed by the cementite, and this is the rate at which it's being taken to the cementite from the carbon-rich region near the ferrite to the uh, carbon-depleted region near the cementite. Now, this is diffusion through the volume of the austenite ahead of the austenite here, J, J with V. But in fact, 
we can also have diffusion through the boundary here. So all we do to modify and take account of the two fluxes, one through the volume and one through the boundary, is we add a flux term for the diffusion through the interface, okay? So again, without going into details, this becomes extremely important when we are dealing with uh, polar growth at low temperatures because the di volume diffusion coefficient becomes very small compared with the boundary diffusion coefficient. But at high temperature, there's much more volume available than boundary. So volume diffusion dominates the total flux. And if I show you some calculations here, uh, this black curve is what you would get if you calculated the growth rate, assuming only diffusion through the volume of the austenite ahead of the uh, transformation front. This is the curve that you would get for the growth rate if you only had diffusion through the interface. And the actual scenario is in between that volume diffusion really dominates at high temperatures but you have to take account, more and more account of the flux through the interface as the transformation temperature is reduced. And this graph here shows the ratio of the flux through the volume and through the boundary. You can see that the volume flux increases relative to the boundary as we go up in temperature. Okay, so this basically uh, completes uh, the de kinetic description of perlite. And we've assumed that the average composition of the austenite does not change when perlite forms. And that is absolutely the case when we are dealing with the binary ion carbon system. But supposing uh, we have manganese in our steel and the manganese prefers to be in the austenite than in uh, the other two phases, then uh, the composition of the austenite will change as the perlite grows, because there will be a three-phase field where austenite, ferrite, and cementite can be in equilibrium. That is not the case, uh, except at the constant eutectoid temperature where the three phases can be equilibrium, uh, in equilibrium in FEC. So with FEMNC, uh, the, there is actually a temperature regime where all three phases can coexist in equilibrium. That means that the perlite reaction can never go to completion because there will be an equilibrium volume fraction of ferrite, cementite, and austenite. Okay? And as more and more perlite forms in, in that three-phase three region, the driving force for its transformation decreases because the composition of the austenite is changing. And therefore, what you see is that the interlamellar spacing has to increase as the colony increases in size. Okay? Uh, simply because the driving force for transformation is decreasing, so your critical spacing at which all, all the free energy is consumed in creating interfaces is also getting larger. Now, this is a, a drawing that I've done. Uh, I don't have the authority to put the actual picture online, but you can see it in uh, figure 4.17 of the Steele's book that is associated with this course. So that is the end of all the major transformations that we have in Steele's.